In the last lecture, we met the diode as a rectifier, and we studied various versions of it, the half-wave rectifier, the full-wave rectifier, and the bridge rectifier. And near the end, we also discussed how to make the output of a diode rectifier closer to the target DC that we want by applying a filter, in particular the capacitor filter. We treated the capacitor filter circuit that day in a qualitative fashion. Today we are going to be a bit more quantitative about the way a diode rectifier with a capacitor filter behaves. So just to remind you, this is the diode rectifier circuit with the capacitor filter. Without the capacitor, it would be just a standard half-wave rectifier with the output being present only in the positive half of the input cycle and being zero in the negative half of the input cycle. And uh, for the rest of this uh, lecture, for most of it at least, we are going to assume that the diodes are ideal. So they conduct current without any voltage drop in the forward direction and block current completely in the reverse direction. What we have done here is we have added an extra capacitance across the load resistance R and it is this capacitance which will make this circuit behave uh, differently. It's in fact going to make the output pretty steady. So at a qualitative level we explain what's go going on here. The black dots here indicate the input signal and the purple dots are the output voltage, that is the voltage across the CR combination out here. And initially, the capacitor is uncharged and as VI increases in the positive direction, the diode is forward biased and the capacitor charges up very, very rapidly through the low resistance path provided by the diode. So the diode is nearly zero resistance, the capacitor charges up almost instantaneously. Now, this continues as long as the input voltage is rising, but once the input voltage, voltage starts to fall, the capacitor voltage is now bigger than the input voltage and the diode now becomes reverse biased. So, the capacitor can no longer discharge along the low resistance path provided by the diode. It has to discharge only through the high, much higher resistance path provided by the low resistance. So, the capacitor does discharge, but very slowly. In fact, in this picture, I've drawn this on a much more exaggerated scale in order that you can see what's going on. And the cyan curve here indicates a diode current. Notice that the diode is on and conducts current only during the first quarter cycle. That's atypical. After that, diode conducts current only when the input voltage overtakes the capacitor voltage. Which, has, which remember is decreasing all the time and then the capacitor charges up again rapidly to the peak the diode current is on during that time and then the diode current falls off to zero once again and the capacitor again starts slowly discharging and the blue curve here the deep blue curve is the voltage across a diode notice that at the peak of the input voltage, or rather at the negative peak of the input voltage, this end is at minus Vp, whereas the other end is almost at Vp. Remember the capacitor reached Vp when the input voltage peaked, and since then it's decreasing, but it's decreasing slowly. So by the time that the input voltage has come to minus Vp, the capacitor voltage is still almost at Vp, which means that the maximum out voltage difference that's put across the reverse bias diode is nearly 2 Vp. So the peak inverse voltage for this circuit is almost 2 Vp. It's actually not twice the peak voltage, it's slightly less. But if your, if your filter circuit is any good, then this dip in the peak voltage will be rather small, not as big as the one which has been indicated here. And so this turns out to be a pretty good approximation. Okay, now let us uh, try to estimate how big the ripple, this drop from the peak to the lowest value really is. Remember, as I'm 
saying over and over again the first quarter cycle here is atypical after that the output is going to go from the peak to a slightly lower value then it will charge up again to the peak then discharge to a slightly lower value then charge up to the peak thus it goes on now the rate at which the capacitor discharges through the resistance of course depends on the voltage across the capacitor which is decreasing all the time here right while it's discharging however as we have assumed this discharge is very slow so the voltage across the capacitor can be approximately taken to be a peak value which is vp so the capacitor discharges at a, at a rate which is roughly equal to vp by r of course assuming that the current is fixed at vp by r would really not be right however as we have been saying the capacitor will discharge rather slowly and will really not get a chance to discharge very much before the input voltage overtakes the capacitor voltage again so as a result we can take this as a pretty good first approximation at least for the current delivered by the by the capacitor as long as it is discharging and another way of seeing that would be this curve is nearly a straight line because the current delivered by the capacitor which is the rate at which it loses charge and hence its potential decreases is nearly a constant of course as you all know the cap curve is really not a straight line it's really a uh, an exponential curve but the exponential nature of the curve will show up only after a long long time not in the small interval of time the capacitor gets to discharge before which the input voltage crosses the capacitor voltage again and makes the capacitor charge up so how long does the capacitor discharge in this cycle well it discharges for a time which is slightly smaller than the time period capital t and if the capacitor filter is any good then the decrease in the voltage will be rather small so the capacitor voltage will be caught up by the input voltage only once the input voltage nearly reaches the peak again so although this time is a is really slightly less than capital t is pretty close to capital t so at the level at which we are discussing things we can take the time of discharge to be approximately capital t namely the time period of the discharge so how much charge does the capacitor lose in the process simple is the current dp by r times the time period capital t but once the capacitor loses charge its potential decreases so the potential difference across the capacitor changes by the amount given by the charge it loses divided by capital c the capacitance and that is nothing but the peak to peak ripple voltage introduced by the capacitor filter the voltage goes from this peak value to this trough value here and the peak to peak ripple voltage remember the ripple is a variable part which is there over and above the average dc part in the voltage and the peak to peak value for that is given by this quantity t by r vp divided by the capacitance t by r c vp so notice that the crucial role here is played by this capital t by r c ratio capital t is a time period of the signal and r c is a time constant of your r c circuit so as long as the time constant of the circuit is much much longer compared to the time period of the signal we have a very tiny amount of ripple which is what makes for a good filter so we can easily achieve that by choosing a large enough capacitance provided r the load resistance has a reasonable value another way of expressing the same thing would be vp by rcf where f is the frequency 1 by t uh, one word of warning frequency is often quoted directly as it is here or very often you will see omega which is the angular frequency 2 pi times this frequency so whenever you see frequency mentioned somewhere please make sure which frequency is being really used here we mean the actual frequency inverse of the time period so for our standard household ac for example the frequency 
should be around 50 hertz capital T would be around 20 milliseconds and if RC is of the order of one second let's say then 20 milliseconds by 10 seconds by one second would be a pretty small number so we would expect a pretty small ripple in such cases and to get an RC of one second with a kilo ohm order resistance it's pretty simple all you need is a millifarad order capacitance now what about the average value of the DC voltage well the average value will be assuming that there's a straight line decrease and assuming that this part hardly counts which is again true as long as the filter is good this will be a straight line decrease and this part will be very small the average will simply be the average the average of DC value can simply be approximated by the average of the peak and the trough so it's basically Vp minus half of V ripple peak to peak and when you use that you end up with this result so once again you see that the DC by voltage average or DC output here is very close to the peak value of the input voltage Vp the, it, it drops from it a bit but not much it drops from it simply because of the fact that there is some ripple but if it's a good filter circuit T by RC should be very small so VDC should be very close to VP now another thing that we need to calculate now is the ripple factor which essentially is the RMS value of the ripple voltage divided by the DC value of the ripple voltage now one important thing to bear in mind is here we don't really have a sinusoidal voltage for the ripple the ripple is really triangular it goes up from plus V ripple peak to peak by 2 to minus V ripple peak to peak by 2 and goes straight up almost and then carries out another downward line and so on. So its RMS value of course can be calculated very easily. You just square this and take the integrated over, over a complete period divided by the time period. And if you do that, it turns out that the RMS value for the triangular waveform works out to be the peak to peak voltage by 2 which is the peak voltage, peak ripple voltage by root 3. So contrast this with the sinusoidal case. In the sinusoidal case, it would have been peak voltage by root 2. Here is peak voltage, which is Vr Pb by, Pb by 2 by root 3. So root 3 in place of root 2. This is an important distinction to bear in mind. And of course, given the value of Vr peak to peak that we have calculated a while ago, this turns out to be the peak voltage divided by 2 root 3 times RCF. You have to divide this by VDC to get the ripple factor. And at the approximation level at which we are working, you can easily approximate VDC by simply by VP. And when you do that, the RMS voltage uh, uh, by, the ripple, by the DC voltage, which is the ripple factor, works out to be 1 by 2 root 3 RCF. So as you can see once again, it's the T by RC or 1 by RCF factor, which is the controlling feature of this capacitor filter. If that is small, the ripple factor is going to be small and your circuit is going to work nicely. And just to point out, this is the ripple factor for the half wave rectifier with the capacitor filter. If I put a capacitor filter on the output of a full wave rectifier, the discharge would not have occurred for the entire time capital T or nearly capital T. It would have occurred a lot earlier because the input voltage to the filter would have come back as a positive voltage here and would have given the filter ha roughly half the time to discharge. So then the ripple factor would be one half of this or 1 by 4 root 3 RCF. That is for a full wave rectifier with a capacitor filter. Now, there are other possible filters beyond the capacitor filter. We will not spend a lot of time describing all of them, but qualitatively at least it should be very easy to see why the LC filter is expected to work better than the capacitor filter. The L in front essentially blocks the AC in the output from going across. L after all acts as a high resistance for AC, 
So, it blocks the AC from going through and the C essentially shorts all of the AC out and so the overall voltage which you get at the output is more DC than you put in. So, which is why it's going to have considerably less ripple than what you put in. You can improve upon this by using the CLC filter also called the Pi filter where basically you put a capacitor filter first then you put a LC filter after that and then you connect the output load across the whole thing. This is going to be even better as a filter circuit. Well, depending on how flat an output you really want, you should either go in for a capacitor filter or an LC filter or a CLC filter. There are other considerations at play here. For example, an inductance. An uh, inductance is pretty costly compared to a capacitance. So, inductance may not be the best thing for you to use. So, these are things you have to keep in mind when you are actually designing a filter circuit for a rectifier. Now, it might seem to most of you that the rectifier is about the only thing that a diode is good for. After all, it only allows current to flow in one direction and not in the other. So, what else can it do other than change an AC into a DC? Well, you will be surprised how many other circuits actually use the diode actively. But before we go on to discuss some of those circuits, let me point out one thing. The diodes that are used in rectifier circuits are typically called rectifier diodes. They are specially manufactured so that they can carry rather large amount of forward current as well as withstand a large peak inverse voltage without um, burning up. And one way in which they achieve that is to have a large surface area so that the heat can be dissipated away. But large area has a disadvantage. The disadvantage is that the depletion region in a PN junction diode essentially behaves like an insulating region in between two conducting regions, right? In the depletion region, there are no charge carriers. On the two sides, there are charge carriers. What do you get when you put an insulator between two conductors? The answer is a capacitance. So, diodes actually have quite a significant amount of capacitance. And this capacitance essentially works like a low impedance and shorts out the diode from, and prevents it from working when you, you are operating at very high frequencies. So, because of the rather large size large area involved for rectifier diodes, the rectifier diodes have a rather large, relatively speaking of course, capacitance. As a result, rectifier diodes cannot really be used at high frequencies. At high frequencies, the capacitor, the stray capacitor which is there because of this effect, will essentially bypass the PN junction and prevent the rectifier from working. So, rectifier diodes are typically used at low frequencies. But that's not a problem because the most common usage is to change the input AC to your house or some other or your lab into a corresponding DC. And the input AC is at rather low frequency around 50 hertz to 60 hertz or so. Rectifier diodes are fine for that. However, diodes are also used for signal processing, shaping of pulses many other uses as we will soon discuss and for that we often need the diodes to work at high frequencies. These diodes are not designed to work with large currents. They are actually called small signal diodes but they are suitable for working at high frequencies. So despite the fact that the symbol is the same and we call them the diode and we pretend while discussing theoretically that they are the same device. There are major dif differences in the construction of a rectifier diode and a small signal diode. In the circuits that we are going to discuss next, we are going to use uh, small signal diodes. And these circuits are called diode clippers and clampers. So, what exactly is a diode clipper? Let us start with the simplest example. 
the so-called positive clipper. A positive clipper circuit is almost exactly like a half wave rectifier circuit. The basic half wave rectifier circuit without any filter. Just a resistance and a diode in series with each other. The only difference is that here we are taking the output not across a resistance but across a diode. What will this output look like? Well, assuming that the diode is ideal, in the, forward, in the positive half of the cycle, the diode will be forward biased and will have no voltage drop across it. So the output voltage will be exactly zero. In the negative half of the cycle, on the other hand, the diode will behave like a switch which is off, no current will flow in the circuit, no drop will occur across the resistance, so the entire input voltage, whatever it is, will be dropped across the diode. So, this is what the output voltage will look like. Assuming, of course, that the diode is ideal, the output will be zero for the positive half of the cycle and will be exactly equal to the input for the negative half of the cycle and zero again for the positive half and so on. Note that although I have used a sinusoidal signal as an example here, we could have used any other kind of signal given to this particular diode circuit and what would happen is that the positive half of the cycle would be clipped off and only the negative half retained. So this is why it's called a positive clipper. It po clips off the positive part. Of course, this is assuming that the diode is ideal. But given the fact that typically we will be working with pretty small sized voltages, ignoring the diode cutting voltage may not be a great idea. So just remi to remind you that uh, this is one level of approximation that we can use in place of a real diode. We can assume that it's an ideal diode with an opposing voltage of V gamma or cutting voltage in series with it which means only when the input voltage exceeds V gamma will you have conduction. So if the input voltage is less than V gamma, the diode will not conduct and the entire voltage will be dropped across the diode. Why? Because there will be no drop across RS. On the other hand, when the input voltage is more than V gamma, the diode will conduct and now you will have a fixed voltage drop V gamma across it. So going beyond the ideal diode approximation, at least taking the cutting voltage into account, we get the following output. The output voltage VO is fixed at V gamma whenever VI exceeds V gamma. So when the diode gets forward biased, the drop across it is fixed at V gamma, the cutting voltage. So these are the val flat values you see here. And when the diode is reverse biased, which happens when VI is less than equal to V gamma, the output voltage is exactly equal to VI. So the positive half is clipped, not, but not quite all of the positive half, a bit of the positive half remains because of the cut-in voltage. So this actually tells you that using a diode for a clipper does not exactly achieve the pulse shaping need that you may have. If you wanted to exactly get rid of the positive half of the cycle, this will not really do it precisely. We will later see that this and other problems due to non-idealities of the diode which happens for the other circuits to follow can be circumvented rather brilliantly when we learn about op-amps and use active clippers and clampers involved using op-amps. But that's for a later lecture. For the time being, as long as uh, the input voltage peak size is much, much bigger than V gamma, this really behaves very close to an ideal situation. But this problem is there. You have to keep that in mind. Now, if you were to reverse the diode, then instead of clipping off of the positive half, it will just clip off the negative half. Again, if it were ideal, it would exactly clip off, clip off the negative half. In the negative half of the input cycle, diode would be forward biased so no drop would occur across it and in the positive half of the input cycle the diode will not conduct hence no current through rs no drop across rs because uh, of the cutting voltage what will happen is the diode will actually conduct only when vi drops below minus v gamma negative vi 
In the negative cycle, if that exceeds V gamma, only then is the diode forward biased. That is, Vi is less than minus V gamma for that. And then the diode voltage will be minus V gamma. Fix held fixed there. If Vi exceeds minus V gamma, then the voltage will be exactly equal to Vi. Now, in addition to having the unintended bias which V gamma provides, you can actually put in additional bias if you want. If you add a battery to the circuit plus V, then you really have two batteries here. One that you can see, the V, the battery with voltage V. Another, the reverse biasing battery V gamma, which is part of the diode anyway. And so, when the input voltage exceeds V plus V gamma, VO is going to be flat at V plus V gamma. Because there will be no drop across the ideal part of the diode. And the two batteries here, the actual battery that you can see and the effective battery that the circuit has, that the diode has, the two together will produce a voltage drop of V plus V gamma across the output. If VI is less than this value, V plus V gamma, or equal, then VI is going to be exactly equal to VO because there will once again be no current flowing in the circuit. So no drop across RS. But this is an example of a biased positive clipper. You can have a biased negative clipper as well. And this, well, th this works almost the same way as before. I don't think I need to really explain this in any detail to you. The next circuit that we will look at is called the limiter. Also called a diode clamp, but please don't confuse it with the diode clamper. The two are different circuits. And this circuit looks rather trivial. It's just in place of one diode, which was either pointing up or down in the case of the two cl clippers that you saw before. Here you have two diodes connected across each other in parallel, but pointing in different directions. Now if these were ideal diodes, doing this would have been useless because Ideal diodes conduct in only one direction and not in the other. But you have two parts parallel to each other, one conducting when the input is positive and the other conducting when the input is negative. They effectively form a single wire and this would be nothing other than a short. So if these diodes were ideal, the output would have been zero throughout. Not really a very useful circuit in that sense. However, remember the diodes only conduct when the cutting voltage is exceeded. So, when the input is positive and exceeds the cutting voltage, then this diode will, will conduct, the diode on the right will conduct, and the output voltage will be fixed at V gamma. When the input is negative and is bigger than V gamma in magnitude, so it's less than minus V gamma, then this diode on the left will conduct, and then the output will stay fixed at minus V gamma. But if the input voltage is in the narrow region between minus V gamma and plus V gamma, neither of the two diodes will conduct, no current will flow in the circuit, so the output voltage will exactly follow the input voltage. So assuming a cutting voltage of around 0.7 volts, the output will actually mimic the input voltage when it's between minus 0.7 volts and plus 0.7 volts. And will just hold the value fixed at plus 0.7 or minus 0.7 depending on whether the input voltage is positive beyond 0.7 or negative beyond minus 0.7. Now what good would such circuit do? Well, if you have a very sensitive piece of equipment, it only works when the input is rather small in size. This circuit could actually work pretty well in uh, protecting your circuit from any surge in the input. So if your input signal was supposed to be between minus 0.7 volts and plus 0.7 volts most of the time, but sometimes surge beyond that, putting a circuit like this before you connect your actual sensitive piece of equipment to this would protect your equipment from any such surges because the output here will never exceed 0.7 volts in magnitude. Well, you can change that by adding some biasing batteries. It's pretty easy to figure out. Just by adding 
such proper biasing batteries here I've just taken two equal size batteries but you could actually do it with even unequal size batteries but the basic idea is you could clip off both the positive side and the negative side and just Uh, limit the output to a section of the input, not the whole input. This is why this is called the limiter. The, bi the bias limiter is so called because there are extra bias batteries which are being put in here. So these voltages and limits are set by the externally connected bias batteries, not just by the cutting voltage of the diode. And if you are not looking very closely, these look more or less like a square wave. Especially if the V is small, this looks pretty close to a square wave. If your VI is pretty big and V is small comparatively. So this is one quick way of producing a square wave output from a sine wave input, for example. Now we come to the next kind of circuit. So far we have been talking about diode clippers. The limiter is essentially a clipper which limits clips both positive and negative sides. Here we are going to talk about the next kind of circuit. This is called a diode clamper. Now we start with this circuit which is really not the clamper. This is essentially the half wave rectifier circuit with a capacitor filter. We have just taken out the load resistance which essentially means that the capacitor, once it reaches its peak, will not discharge at all. Of course, you might argue that in order to use such a circuit, you would have to connect something across it, and that something will draw some current. So the capacitor not discharging at all will not really be true, and you would be right. But if you assume that whatever you're going to connect across this has a very high impedance, which can be managed either because you are connecting a circuit with a very high impedance, impedance or there are special tricks which can make even a circuit with low impedance look like one with high impedance. We will explore several of them later. Uh, ultimately what will happen is we can mimic the situation of infinite impedance pretty well. So the output voltage will be held more or less fixed at the peak value. But this is if the capacitor is the thing across which you are taking the volt output. The clamper essentially is the same circuit but with the capacitor and the diode switched and the output is being taken across a diode. What that means is the diode voltage is what you're looking at and if you just look back at this, the diode voltage plus the capacitor voltage gave you the input voltage or the source voltage. So the source voltage is the green signal here, the capacitor voltage is this line in red. So what happens now is once the capacitor voltage settles down to this flat steady value, the diode voltage, which is the difference between Vs and Vc, will simply be pushed down by this peak value. So it's the input signal voltage, the curve in green, but pushed downwards by this peak value. Of course, in the first quarter cycle, things are a bit different. In the first quarter cycle, a diode is conducting and there is no voltage across a diode, assuming ideal diode behavior. So you will have a flat line for the diode voltage here. Then the rest of it will be this simply comes down by Vp. And so this is what is going to happen. And what this does is it takes the input voltage waveform, does not change it, but just clamps it to zero. That is, it pushes it until the peak goes to zero. So this is basically what clamping is. It doesn't clip off the input signal. The input signal is not mutilated in any way. You get the full signal, but it's pushed up or down until it gets clamped at a level. So here it's clamped above at zero. Well, if you reverse a diode, I will leave you to worry about this, but this is basically very simple. If you reverse the diode, of course, what is going to happen is once proper clamping happens, but once the capacitor fully charges and maintains its charge, the diode voltage gets clamped below. Essentially, it gets pushed up. The input voltage gets pushed up. What you get is an exact replica of the input voltage, assuming once again ideal diode behavior, but pushed upwards so that the minimum value is zero. So this is a positive diode clamp. 
So there are many other variants which are possible on the clipper and the clamper. And in each case, the fact that the diode is not an ideal element, it's a real diode that you, that you have to use in a circuit, causes some deviations in the behavior of the clipper and the clamper from what you really want it to do. And if you want this to actually do precision pulse shaping, which is often very in, important in, in many advanced experiments, um, these circuits may not just cut it. They may not be good enough. But as I promised, later on we are going to learn about active clippers and clampers involving op-amp circuits, operational amplifier circuits, which will form a large bulk of our course. And there we will see that we can modify these same basic ideas, these clipper-clamper based ideas, to produce circuits which work much, much better. In fact, works almost as if you had, you really had the ideal diodes. Okay, next we come to another circuit which uses diodes. This is called a peak-to-peak -peak detector. But before we go on to talk about the peak-to-peak -peak detector, let's dig this circuit up into pieces. If we just looked at this part, the first rectangle here, the sinusoidal source, capacitor and diode. This is exactly what you saw a while ago. This, is, this would be a positive clamper something which pushes the input up until the it's only in one direction until it's completely positive now what is the circuit which comes after that this really is nothing but a half wave rectifier with the capacitor filter now as we have been saying from the very beginning if your capacitor filter is any good which essentially means your RC is large, then what is going to happen is your capacitor is going to get to the peak voltage and then maintain the peak voltage and stay almost flat at the peak voltage. Let me point out one important thing. Here we are dealing with very high frequency signals, perhaps often. So the time in which the capacitor gets to discharge may be even smaller than when you are using this for ordinary rectifier use. So the output will be even flatter for this, this kind of circuit when you are using it at a high frequency. Okay, so basically the half wave rectifier with the capacitor filter can also be thought of as a peak detector. It just holds the peak value. Now here something else happens. The input voltage here is being shown. I have shown a sinusoid. You can try figuring out what will happen if you don't use a sinusoid. What the positive clamper does is that it pushes up the output so that the whole input is replicated but pushed up so that it's always positive. So at this point, the output of the positive clamper, this is the output that you get. The whole thing is pushed up so that the whole output is positive. But this now has a peak which is up here, which is really at the peak to peak voltage. So if this were an exact sinusoid, this would be at twice the peak voltage. But if this were not an exact sinusoid, if it were some other waveform, the bottom would still be clamped to zero. If the whole thing would be pushed up. And if the bottom is clamped to zero, the top will go to the, go to the peak to peak voltage. That's what happens. Here, but this is still a varying signal like this. But now comes the speak detector part, which is really the a half wave rectifier with a capacitor filter. So what will that do? It will essentially hold the peak voltage fixed. Peak voltage for this fixed. So the output will essentially look like this. I have strongly ex exaggerated the variation which will happen because of the capacitor discharging. In reality, if there are high frequencies involved and if the resistances are reasonably large, you're going to get a very, very small dip. But this nearly flat output voltage, what will that be? That will be the peak value of this voltage and that will be the peak to peak value of the input voltage. So this circuit essentially helps you to convert an input signal to an output flat DC or nearly flat DC. And the value of the DC voltage is the peak to peak value 
of the input signal. Now, measuring a DC voltage is actually much, much easier and more reliable than measuring parameters for time dependent voltages. So, very often this comes in very handy. You give an arbitrarily shaped input voltage and this circuit will convert that to an DC output which is equal to its peak to peak voltage. And now you can use a DC voltmeter to measure off the peak to peak voltage of the input. Okay, now we come to one more application of the diodes and this time we are going back to using rectifier diodes. Remember I said that if, when you are using clippers, clampers, peak detectors, peak to peak detectors, limiters, usually you want to work at small signal voltages, not necessarily at high voltages or high currents and you want to work at reasonably high frequencies. Rectifier diodes, on the other hand, are designed to work at much higher voltages, much higher load currents, but not at high frequencies. Here, what we are going to do is use uh, the rectifier diodes again in a circuit, and we are going to use them to multiply output voltages. So. Let's see our first choice. The first choice here is what is called a voltage doubler. So what is a voltage doubler? It's simply a circuit which doubles the, voltage, the input voltage peak. So it gives an a DC output which is twice the input voltage peak. Now you might say this is nothing but the peak to peak detector that we put in a while ago. And the answer is yes, the circuit is the same, but there's a big difference. And the, the big difference involves is basic usage. What we are doing here is we, are show, we have shown here that you have used a sinusoidal source with a transformer here. And the transformer is more, uh, well, really here to indicate to you that this is really more for a more of a power supply kind of situation. So here you are really trying to make a rectified output which will produce power. So we took take a power, take a voltage signal from the means which is low frequency. So we can use rectifier diodes here. You have a transformer which changes your voltage to whatever you want. And then you have this part. Remember, this is nothing but a positive clamper. It clamps the output and pushes it up so that the peak value goes to 2VP. And now you have a hardware rectifier with a capacitor filter or a peak detector, whatever you call it. And that keeps your output fixed at twice VP. So if you had just dropped this part of the circuit and just connected the, the, this diode and the capacitor and the resistance, the output would have been VP. Here you have two VP. Now you might be wondering, why do we need this circuit at all? After all, we have a transformer here, right? The transformer is needed to change whatever input voltage you have, maybe 230 volts from your AC means into whatever voltage you want. So if you wanted twice VP instead of VP, say instead of, if your transformer produces a 10 volt peak, volt peak volt sinusoidal voltage, after stepping it down, uh, if you just use your hardware rectifier with a capacitor filter across that, you would get 10 volts flat as your DC. With this circuit, you are going to get 20 volts flat. Big deal. After all, couldn't you do that just by using a different transformer? You could use a transformer which steps down less and this will work. Well, that would be exactly right. However, notice that uh, we often use transformers not only to step down but to step up as well. Suppose I wanted 4000 volts DC as an output. My mains comes at 230 volts. I would have to use a step up transformer and then use these diodes. Of course, I will have to be very careful in when we choose the diodes, they have, will have to have large enough peak inverse voltages. But that's fine. We can always find them in the market just by looking carefully enough. So why don't I just step up all the way to 4000 volts peak and then use the hardware rectifier with the capacitor filter or what we are calling a peak detector here. 
we could have used that except that the bigger amount the amount of step up a transformer provides the bulkier it has to be the more wire has to be wound the more more has to be the number of turns involved and that and in order to dissipate the amount of uh, heat that is produced here we will need a lot of large surface area and so on so beyond the point it becomes impractical to actually produce a uh, large enough transformer to do the job it's actually better and cheaper and safer to use diodes appropriately chosen diodes to produce the voltage doubling so you could have done this with a transformer but there comes a point beyond which transformers we step up that much become more expensive and then this becomes a much better choice of course it might also happen that you have only one transformer which produces a 10 volt peak output and you need a 20 volt peak then you will have to go in for this if going out and buying another transformer is not an option well you don't really stop at doubling you can actually do something more well if you look carefully this is the voltage doubler circuit out here which we have drawn if you just ignore the rl for the timing the rl of course has to be rather large so that the capacitor does not discharge very fast so ideally rl should be open to not be there in the circuit at all now if you ignore the rl in the circuit for the timing you should see that these two compartments here is exactly the same as these two compartments they have just been drawn a bit differently this capacitor has been pushed down here this diode has been pushed down this capacitor has been moved this way but this is essentially the same circuit as this one so this is really a voltage doubler what you have is another clamper after that i will let you worry about why the circuit works the way it does it's pretty interesting to think about it yourself so please think about it and try to figure out that what will happen once things settle out is that this diode will start of hold itself fixed at vp this diode of course holds the output fixed at 2 vp this is the output that you were seeing in the voltage doubler before and this diode will also say its output fixed at 2 vp and so if you were to take the output not between not across this two or not across this diode but across this pair of points this point and this point you will get 3 vp as your output voltage so now you have a voltage tripler so whatever output voltage just the peak detector would have produced from the transformer this circuit produces three times as much well you can add one more segment to this the same circuit notice the same circuit as this one just one more one more component to this essentially repeating this over and over again now i will let you worry about why this is this was 2 vp as i said by the way this is nothing but the voltage doubler this also is 2 vp why you will have to think about it a bit but just think about forward bias diodes and how much voltages they can carry and the fact that once the capacitor fully charges it reverse biases the diode and doesn't allow any current to flow and so on with this in your this uh, behind your belt you should be able to easily understand why the voltage drop between this point to this point is four times vp so voltage quadrupler in the this circuit can work as a voltage doubler if you take this output a tripler if you take this output a quadrupler if you take this output now you can of course keep on adding more and more cells and actually going further and further down you can multiply voltages by 5 6 and so on so just think about it it's pretty interesting i will leave you to worry about exactly how the circuits are functioning you know enough about ideal diodes to be able to figure them out yourself but this is really very fascinating and interesting the next lecture will be on zener diodes a kind of special diodes which actually are designed to operate not in the forward bias but in the reverse biased breakdown region and using that we will also try to fix one more problem our rectifiers the kind that we have discussed so far have that of not being regulated well enough what that means i will explain in detail in the next video